All right, thank you very much. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to be at Oval Wolf Park, even remotely. Um, so this is a uh, joint work uh, with Brian Tran, who's a graduate student of mine, and he's been working sort of, um, you know, very much on this area. It's like since he was an undergraduate with me, um, and it's uh, been very generously funded by the National Science Foundation, the Air Force, as well as the Department of Defense. So let's try to give you some sense as to what the, um, the basic framework is. So as you probably all know, it's like structural preservation is concerned. Uh, primarily, it's like with two different approaches, one of which has to do with this notion of compatible discretization in the context of finite element methods and in particular spatial semi-discretization. Of course, the geometric numerical integration community uh, primarily arose out of the time integration community, even though um, these days there's of course a lot of work done um, in discretization of PDEs in a geometric way as well. So, uh, so compatible discretization preserves in some manner the functional, algebraic, topological, and geometric relationships between function spaces that arise in the formulation of the PDE. Um, and so perhaps the most um, sort of well-known example of that now is uh, this framework known as finite element mixture calculus, um, which was developed by Arnold Falcon Winter. Um, and geometric numerical integration obviously is concerned with the preservation of geometric variants like symplectic and Poisson structures, um, energy momentum, as well as nonlinear manifold structures that are configuration spaces like the Lie group structure, homogeneous space structure, or Riemannian structure. So, so I'm primarily interested in, in today's talk about uh, sort of Lagrangian Hamiltonian PDEs. And there you can treat them either in sort of a covariant way, thinking of um, the problem being formulated in both space and time and having the fields over that. Uh, and that leads to a multi-symplectic formulation of the field theory. Or you can think of it um, where time is the primary independent variable. And then you think of, you know, it's like um, <clears throat> spatial functions, uh, which take values in the fields, um, which allows you to think of it as an infinite dimensional canonical system. And what, of course, the covariant formulation naturally leads to what are called multi-symplectic integrators. Um, and the canonical formulation um, naturally brings you down the path of uh, spatial semi-discretization coupled with geometric macro integration in time. So, um, so the goal of this talk is to elucidate how these two approaches are related and under what precise circumstances they yield equivalent methods. Okay, so, uh, so I'm gonna talk about multi-symplectic variational integrators um, in particular. So, um, so when you look at classical field theories, uh, the multi-symplectic structures, uh, encode many important physical phenomena. For example, uh, it tells you something about the conservation of wave action. Uh, it's very closely related to this idea of reciprocity, um, and it reduces the symplecticity under transgression. And um, what you can see, what we'll talk about in a little bit, is that the variational structure encodes the field dynamics, boundary variations, and the conservation laws. And um, so one very, very natural way, obviously, to discretize um, classical field theories, which have a variational formulation, uh, is this approach of variational integrators, which are structure-preserving numerical methods um, in Lagrangian Hamiltonian mechanics, which uh, yield excellent long-time stability and conservation properties. Um, and what we're primarily going to focus on today is how discretizing these variational principles um, affect the continuum structures in the Lagrangian formulation of the theory. Uh, in particular, um, we're going to introduce this notion of a discrete Cartan form, which then has implications for um, both sort of the multi symplectic conservation law as well as uh, the NOVA theorem. Okay, so the, the basic formulation of this uh, is this multi symplectic formulation of field theories. Um, and so if you think of the base space as being uh, space and time, um, and then you have uh, fields over this, right, which you can think of in terms of a uh, fiber bundle. So you have a projection from basically space time points, comma, the field values to space time. Um, and then the fields of fibers over this uh, fiber bundle. And you have a configuration, which basically is a map from a point in space time to the corresponding field values. Um, and then in addition to that, you have the first jet of this, which includes the, um, the space time points, the field values, as well as the first partial derivatives of the fields with respect to uh, the space time directions. And once you have that kind of geometric setting, you can introduce a Lagrangian density, which is a map from this first jet to an n plus one differential form on space time. And, and once you have this, you, what you, is gonna happen is that you, you take a, a section 
of um, this bundle, which is a configuration of the field theory. You look at its uh, jet extension, which means you differentiate the field values with respect to space and time. You evaluate the Lagrangian density on this. This gives you an n plus one differential form, which you can then integrate over an n plus one domain in space and time to give you the action. And then Hamilton's principle just states that the variation of the action is stationary uh, when you fix the, uh, the boundary data uh, on the boundary of the space-time domain. Okay, so, so associated with that is uh, it's also a dual jet bundle, which is an affine dual bundle, and it consists of maps from the first jet. It's like the n plus one forms. And uh, the main point here is that there's a canonical n plus one form uh, theta, which is analogous to the canonical one form um, on the cotangent bundle from manifold. And of course, this canonical one form um, <clears throat> is related to the, uh, the symplectic forms and the multi-symplectic forms, right? Um, in addition to that, there, is, uh, the, there are Lagrange transforms, um, which you can think of as fiber derivatives of the Lagrangian, and they're maps from the first jet to the, the dual of the first jet. Uh, and in the case of mechanics, obviously the fiber derivative of the Lagrangian is a map from the tangent bundle to the cotangent bundle. So once you have this, as you can introduce uh, what is known as the Carton form uh, and the multi symplectic form for this Lagrangian theory, which is uh, given by these expressions, they involve the pullback um, of um, by this fiber derivative um, or the Legendre transform of these um, canonical n plus one forms or of the, um, the multi symplectic form. Okay, and these are the coordinate representations of them. Um, and, as we, and, and when you have that, you can then write down the action um, in, in this way as the pullback. It's like of this, um, you know, it's like. Um, sort of Lagrangian one form, it's like by the jet extension of the field um, of the section. <clears throat> okay, so in any case, um, so once you, you compute, once you have this action expressed in this way, uh, you can compute the variation of the action. Um, and this gives you a term, it's like which vanishes um, on complex, uh, sort of compactly supported variations. So this is what gives you the all Lagrange equations. And then you have a term which has to do with the boundary terms. Um, and so again, if you're, Looking in the context of Hamilton's principle, where you fix the boundary data, that term vanishes. Um, but um, the reason why I've explicitly written it out here is because it encodes uh, the Cartan form, uh, which, as we'll see in a little bit, um, gives you a lot of information, particularly in the context of uh, the multi symplectic structure and the um, and the sort of Nofu theorem. So, so the key point basically is that this Cartan form completely specifies the variational structure, and so we want to construct the discrete analog of this. Okay, so um, so let me say something about uh, conservation laws in this multi symplectic formalism. Um, so you have Nofis theorem, right? So if you have a Lagrangian density which is invariant under a jet lifted group action, then you have uh, that this uh, integral over the boundary, it's like uh, vanishes. Um, so the total flux of the Nofa current through a boundary vanishes. Um, so um, so if you have this formulation, obviously you can apply sort of the generalized Stokes theorem uh, to write down. Uh, the conservation law in uh, sort of divergence form, which is this expression here. And then similarly, if you want to say something about multi-symplecticity, what you do is you take the second exterior derivative of this action um, and you contract it with uh, sort of um, vector fields, which are first variations of the old Lagrange equations, and, and that vanishes. Okay, and that gives you sort of the usual notion of uh, multi-symplecticity. And finally, it's like uh, if you integrate over a space-time cylinder, so you take a um, sort of a product of an interval in time, it's like with some sort of spatial domain uh, with the property of the boundary of that spatial domain vanishes, um, then you get Nofis theorem uh, becomes the conservation of charge and then uh, multi-symplecticity becomes symplecticity. Okay, so, so now we're going to um, try to set up the framework for looking at discretizations of this. So the first thing we're going to try to do is to formulate uh, the variational principle on a Hilbert space. And then what's going to happen next, obviously, is that we're going to look at subspaces of the Hilbert spaces uh, in question. And that's going to be your choice of discretization or, or finite element space. So we're going to take uh, the configuration bundle to be the space of K uh, forms on space-time, uh, where space-time is some polyhedral domain. It's like with a Riemannian or Lorentzian metric. 
And then instead of considering smooth sections, we'll consider these square integrable sections with square integrable exterior derivatives. So I should say that uh, here, we're going to restrict ourselves to the case where the Lagrangian density doesn't depend um, sort of on a generic element of the jet bundle, but basically depends on the field values and its exterior derivative. Okay, so that's a slightly more strict setting, but nevertheless, it is uh, sort of relevant for an extremely large class of uh, interesting problems, uh, in particular, for example, electromagnetism. So, so now you have this Lagrangian density, it's like which can be written in, in this way, right? Uh, and there's an associated action to this, again, restricted to the space time points, the field values, and the exterior derivative of the field. Um, and so now what you can do is you can test this uh, stationarity property um, for all elements uh, in this uh, sort, of, um, <clears throat> sort of test space, right? Um, and um, that gives you um, essentially these Lagrange equations here. So you can also formulate this in terms of vector fields uh, and that um, allows you to rewrite everything in terms of, of these maps, which I won't go too much into. Okay, so, so now let me say something about the uh, you know, finite element discretization. So what you want to do then is want to restrict to a finite dimensional finite element subspace. Um, and so you're going to take a map from this Hilbert space to some finite dimensional subspace. Uh, and the idea is that this is going to be somehow subordinate to a given mesh of triangulation of space time. There's some sort of um, repetition of that. Uh, and this yields um, a action which you can think of here. And the, the interesting thing, of course, is that you can think of this action as being defined on the original Hilbert space, right? So, um, so you take an element Hilbert space, you project onto this uh, final element space, and then you evaluate the action uh, integral. It's like on that section, basically. Um, so, so this is obviously degenerate because the, um, basically what happens then is that even if the original uh, Lagrangian field theory was non-degenerate, this action in general will be degenerate because um, the projection map has, uh, has a non-trivial current, okay? All right, so, um, so in general then this uh, expression which you have here for the Lagrangian density is not holonomic. So it's not the, basically it's not the jet extension of a section, okay? Um, so we want to enforce uh, this uh, property that that thing is holonomic using a discrete uh, hamilton von Dragon principle, which is given here. So you basically impose the condition that uh, it's holonomic with a essentially a Lagrange multiplier. And this gives you uh, this set of equations which you have here. So, so that's, you know, so that allows you to, to work um, again with a fairly general class of, of projections. But what we'll see in a little bit is that there's a, a natural distinguished class of projections of finite element spaces, which work very, very nicely with these kind of field theories. Um, so let's uh, focus on those. So if the projections are what are called co-chain projections, which basically means that uh, the projection commutes with the exterior derivative, uh, then this uh, argument for the Lagrangian density, which you have here is automatically holonomic. Uh, and then there's no need then to use the hamilton pontryagin approach in that setting. Okay, so um, so for, for the remainder of this talk, then it's like I'm going to primarily focus uh, on the case where you have coaching projections. So with that assumption, then the variational principle applied to, applied to this degenerate action and restricted to solutions which live in this space yield uh, the discrete uh, weak or Lagrange equations, which are given here. So, so you might ask, why am I sort of making these two um, statements separately, right? And, and the reason is because, as I said before, you have SH, which is now a degenerate action. And you can think of that as defining, uh, you know, it's like a field theory on the original continuum of space, right? With the problem that there's now not a single unique solution, but there's a family of solutions um, which are related um, by essentially things in the kernel of the projection map, okay? Um, and, and so in order for you to then get a well-defined element, it's like of that, you, you look only for solutions which live in this finite dimensional space of, um, of functions basically, or of sections, okay? Um, and uh, when you do that, it's like you get these equations here. And this is obviously the usual thing you do. It's like that the trial space is, um, you know, is a finite dimensional space as well, right? Um, um, Melvin, can I interrupt? Yes. Sure. Uh, can you give an example of a co-chain projection for some standard finite element space? 
Um, so any of the finite element exterior calculus spaces um, will satisfy this property. Oh, they, okay. Okay. Yeah. So so finite element exterior calculus, um, you know, it's like involves finite element spaces which are coaching projections together with some bounded this property as well. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So so if you integrate by parts, you get these equations. And then the point is that the boundary term vanishes uh, for the purposes of the old Lagrange equation as before, because your variations there, um, I mean, it's like, because the few values are fixed on the boundary of space time, but this expression then characterizes the discrete Cartan form. And as we'll see, it's like, this then allows you to say something about the multi-symplectic form formula and then Nova's chain. All right, so to the state, uh, so in order to, to make sense of this, we're, we're going to have to try to localize the equations. Uh, and what I mean by that is that we're going to have to look at um, test functions. It's like which which are somehow it's like locally supported. Um, so we want to localize these discrete Lagrange equations. And um, so we're going to look at um, basically a region uh, which is regular. And the basic idea behind the region being regular is that um, if you look at nodes um, of uh, some domain, um, node of a domain is basically um, an interior point uh, if um, if u intersects all the elements which touch that node. Um, and then u bar here is the union of all elements which touch interior points of u. Um, and so this is, a, this is a u, for example, and then the corresponding u bar is this, right? So a region is regular if u is equal to u bar, which I mean, intuitively more or less says that you have a region which is somehow supported that's like on the mesh in an obvious way. So, so you want to look at admissible variations with respect to this regular region, right? And then what happens then is that you have a localized version of the discrete Lagrange equations where you now test the variations only for admissible B, okay? And this is obviously equivalent to the discrete Lagrange equations, uh, but then it allows me to say something about which is now this discrete Lagrange equations, but in a more localized fashion. Okay, so, so anyway, so the, you might ask, well, why are we going to such trouble? And the reason is because this boundary term, which corresponds to the Cartan, it's like form, right? Essentially involves an integral over a boundary region and that is a little bit more subtle. It's like in, in this discrete setting. So, um, so this Cartan form encodes the boundary variations and in the continuous setting, what happens of course, is that you can, you know, you can take variations which are um, sort of arbitrarily, which are localized arbitrarily close to the boundary. And so you end up just having that the continuous Cartan form is this boundary integral, which you have here. And, and the intuitive idea is that in the discrete setting, this um, discrete version of the Cartan form involves a boundary integral, but it's not just on the boundary, but it's sort of essentially on the, the one ring of the boundary if you have elements which are just supported, it's like on a single element, okay? And if you have elements which sort of have larger support, then this will be a sort of a larger ring around the boundary. So anyway, in this discrete setting, you can dec decompose this form. It's like into a boundary term and an interior term. And then when you do this decomposition, right, then, uh, and you compute um, this um, variation, it's like of the action, um, you end up getting um, sort of two terms, right? And, and, and these two terms sort of give you the discrete Cartan form. I, I should say, uh, these are the two terms you get. It's like after you restrict it to solutions of the discrete Lagrange equations. So when you're on shell, it's like the, you know, you just get these terms basically. So, how should I say? Yeah, it's like when you're on shell, which is to say that you are on the solution of discrete Lagrange equations, but you don't necessarily have variations which uh, keep the uh, boundary values fixed, then you get these uh, terms coming from the variation. All right, so so um, so that's that's sort of what we call the discrete Cartan form, okay? And uh, yeah, so that's the discrete Cartan form, and um, and it involves again sort of a boundary integral over elements. It's like, which uh, sort of look like this, right? So this is like the one ring again of this boundary of the domain. All right, so um, so with that in mind, it's like you can then uh, sort of um, do some things. It's like with this, you can uh, construct, uh, you can sort of derive the multi symplectic form formula. It's like in terms of this discrete Cartan form, which gives you this expression. Uh, and it gets, um, and it, when you restrict yourself to sort of constant vector fields, uh, then this sort of uh, second term vanish, actually the first term vanish, is, I'm sorry, sorry, the second term vanishes, yep, that's right. And then you're left with something which looks just like the continuous multi-symplectic form formula, um, but with the provisio that this is only localized to 
uh, regular regions as opposed to uh, arbitrary regions. Okay, um, and then you can also um, sort of uh, use this, it's like to say something about no first theorem. Um, so there's, this is the usual continuum no first theorem, and then there's a discrete version of no first theorem, um, which, is, um, which is given here. Um, and so the, the main point basically is that in order to have, uh, you know, it's like uh, no first theorem apply, basically you want some notion of um, sort of symmetry, or you want your discretization, if you will, it's like to, uh, respect the symmetry, it's like which uh, generates it's like the associated NOFA current. And so, in the context again of finite element discretizations, uh, that leads to this idea of group recovariant projection maps. So, these are basically again projection maps which commute with the group action in sort of the obvious way. Uh, and when that happens, then there is a infinitesimal action which uh, gets restricted appropriately. Uh, and when you do that, you can, you will get sort of this uh, discrete version of. Uh, no first here uh, in this fine element setting. Okay, so so there there are some you know very nice things about this, um, and so I think the point basically is that if you were to use fine element mixture calculus right um, to do some discretization and and then do uh, time integration, uh, what basically ends up happening is that you get exactly what you would have gotten if you had done um, you know. Um, a discrete variational discretization using this multi symplectic formulation uh, with a tensor product of um, the spatial finite element space with some finite element space and time. Okay, so, and, and, and again, this is sort of related to the fact that when you look at these um, jet extensions of sections, right, and you try to discretize them, there are basically sort of two choices one can make here, right? So you can first try to discretize um, you can first try to discretize by looking at a jet extension of the projection of this section, okay, which leads to, to this expression. Um, so you project the fields and then you consider the associated jet lift. Or alternatively, you can discretize the jet lifted section. So first you do the jet extension and then you try to project those spaces. Uh, and so these two things are in general different. Um, and in order for them to be the same, it's like you, you obviously need this um, notion of coaching projections, okay. Uh, and as I sort of said before, in response to Robert's question, sort of one very standard class of uh, spaces or coaching projections are these finite element mixture calculus spaces. Um, and they, you know, it's like they, they sort of systematically uh, encapsulate um, a large family of exactly all the um, sort of, you know, stable mixed finite element methods um, by thinking of them in the context of Hilbert complexes and the associated random dimensional subcomplexes. So, so in particular, these finite element mixture calculus spaces are coaching projections, but there are also some additional boundedness assumptions, uh, and they give you isomorphisms on cohomology. Okay, so um, so the, the main point basically is that when you, you have these finite element uh, um, sort of when you have these coaching projection spaces, then there's a whole bunch of naturality results that um, essentially that um, you can relate again these <clears throat> sort of degenerate Lagrangian problems with um, sort of these discrete problems in some sense, okay? And, and the main take home message uh, at the end of it all is that if you have a Lagrangian field theory, which again is expressed in terms of the field values and its exterior derivatives, um, and you look at the corresponding sort of all Lagrange equations, right? And then discretize that using say, uh, finite element exterior calculus, that's gonna end up to be, uh, to be equivalent to first taking this action uh, Lagrangian density, discretizing it by uh, Cauchy projection, and then looking at the corresponding um, stationarity equations of this discrete variational principle. So these two things end up being the same. So the take-home message then is that for this class of Lagrangian PDEs, right, where instead of just the full jet, you're looking at things which just depend on the exterior derivative and the field values, um, it doesn't matter what you do, right? So you could um, you you could take this variational approach, which is sort of um, to construct a multi symplectic integrator, but this is essentially giving you the same result as you would have gotten um, if you had um, sort of first taken the continuous equations and then discretized it um, using sort of the standard finite element approach. Okay, so why this is nice is because obviously there's been a lot of software which has been developed for discretizing PDEs, like using these kind of finite element calculus frameworks. And so this sort of new result is basically saying that in addition to, you know, 
having all the software which allows you to implement this, um, you basically have this huge mathematical framework that's like we're analyzing this in terms of uh, multi-symplectic discretizations. Okay, um, so, so so basically coaching projections are natural. It's like for the open space restricted Lagrangian theory. Um, and you know, it's like, it doesn't matter whether you, when you have these things, it doesn't matter whether you discretize at the level of the configuration bundle or the jet bundle. Um, and there is a, there's a degeneracy. It's like, so there's essentially a correspondence between the discrete theory and then some sort of degenerate continuous theory. And this degeneracy is characterized by this kernel of the projection maps. Um, and, you know, the discrete, discrete structures like the discrete Cartan form, discrete multiplexicity can be interpreted in terms of uh, continuous structures associated with the degenerate continuous theory. And in essence, the, the take home message is that the discrete solution which you get is essentially a canonical representative of the equivalence class of continuous solutions of the degenerate continuous problem. Um, so, so that's sort of a nice way to think about it. Um, and you can, you know, it's like you can, you can extend this theory, it's like um, to semi-discretization, right? Which is sort of the usual setting, uh, which one applies by now in the calculus. So more or less, it's like what the take home message is, is that if you, you know, discretize finite um, if you discretize in space using final mixture calculus and you, you discretize in time using a Galerkian variational integrator, then this is equivalent to the discrete multi-symplectic variational discretization, where you look at shape functions in space and time, which are tensor products of the spatial finite element exterior calculus spaces with the sort of, you know, it's like the interpolants you use, it's like to construct the Galerkian uh, variational integrator. And, and this sort of relates in a very precise sense than this covariant and canonical perspective to Lagrange Hamiltonian PDEs. Um, and if the projections are grouped by covariant, it's like then in addition to the momentum map structure being preserved, the energy momentum map structure is also preserved in this setting. Okay, so, so let me um, say briefly some additional work it's like which uh, the, our group has done. One of which is, is that we've also done this on the Hamiltonian side, all right? So there are these multi-symplectic Hamiltonian variational integrators, which are based essentially on um, discrete analogs of what called the boundary Hamiltonian. There's an it automatically satisfies a discrete multi-symplectic conservation law and an associated discrete NOVA tier. So what's interesting is when you apply this framework to multi-symplectic partition Ruger-Kutta methods, you, you actually um, sort of, you re-derive it's like this condition that in order for this thing to be multi-symplectic, it has to be that the individual Ruger-Kutta methods in space and time are symplectic. Um, what's interesting about this result, however, is that our, our methods are automatically multi-symplectic from the variational principle. So you might ask where the conditions of the runcov method being symplectic comes from. And it comes from the fact that if you look at this space-time tensor product um, representation, it's like of the field values using partition runcov methods, this system of equations is overdetermined. okay? So in order for these system of equations to be consistent, um, that's really where it's like the usual condition that the individual partition worker could have methods are symplectic in space and time arises. So it's a consistency condition as opposed to a condition where you impose it in order to guarantee that it's multi-symplectic. So that's kind of an interesting perspective, but in particular, <clears throat> it recovers, it's like this framework of Bridges and Reich, it's like for multi-symplectic integrators, but now from purely variational perspective without recourse to Lagrangian theory. And then one other thing is that, um, in, in motivation by uh, sort of some talks yesterday, we've also been working on variational approaches to accelerated optimization. Uh, in particular, um, these generalizations of the Nesterov uh, gradient flows, um, which were developed by the group around Michael Jordan at Berkeley. It's like involving the Bregman Lagrangian and Bregman Hamiltonian. Um, and we've um, been able to construct discretizations of this in the vector space case using uh, time adaptive variational Hamiltonian discretizations, which are based on uh, the Poincaré transformation, it's like, uh, which, um, you know, it's like Ernst used to construct, um, you know, time adaptive um, symplectic integrators, uh, but in combination with uh, this new class of methods, these Hamiltonian variational integrators. And in practice, what we see is that they yield superior performance to this Nesterov accelerated gradient method. And we've also looked at the continuous theory for extending the Bregman Lagrangian Hamiltonian to remind in manifolds. Uh, for it, so three classes of objective functions, geodesically convex functions, uh, weakly quasi-convex and strongly convex objective functions. And we've, we've uh, established convergence rates for each of these things in continuous time. And we've also developed variational discretizations of these things for Riemannian sub-manifolds uh, and for Lie groups. 
Let me just uh, conclude by saying that um, the discretizing the variational principle from Lagrangian PDEs using Cochrane projections uh, is a very natural thing to do. And it leads to a discrete Cartan form, which encodes the multi symplectic conservation law and the discrete Nova theorem. Um, so, another important class of projections is this notion of group equivariant projections, uh, which then gives you a very natural relationship between the continuum and semi discrete energy momentum maps. And that if you use Cochrane projections, that the variational principle and discretization commutes. Uh, and if you want to do this in sort of the usual way, which is some sort of spatial semi discretization combined with time integration, then semi-discretization uh, using a coaching projection together with Galactic variational uh, discretization in time is equivalent to this multi-symplectic variational discretization using space-time tensor product finite elements. And what remains to be done is to develop a corresponding variational error analysis result and a quasi-optimality result, which is which would be an analogy to the case for the Rajin ODs. So let me just stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melvin. Are there any questions? Can I just ask then about this um, this connection between the continuous problem with the degenerate Lagrangian and mm -hmm. the discrete one? Yeah, because that uh, seems like an interesting perspective. Sure. Uh, could that help you understand the relationship between the disc discrete and the original continuous solution? I think where it helps you understand it, I think where it's interesting um, is um, there's obviously a lot of interest in trying to choose good um, function spaces, if you will, from the point of view of approximation, right? And traditionally, so, so this is something you see, for example, when you're trying to do model reduction of large systems, BD, OD, no, BD, ODE systems or PDE problems, right? So I think where this it's like, um, adds an interesting perspective is that most of the time when you do model reduction, you have to do sampling it's like of the, um, the solutions it's like and, and compute trajectories, if you will, um, in order to construct some sort of empirical loss function which measures the mismatch. So because of the fact that when you choose a discretization, there's, uh, you, you basically identify that with a sort of gauge and variantized version of the continuum theory, there is an associated momentum map to this. Um, and so you can ask yourself whether that associated momentum map, which comes from the choice of an element space you've chosen, is related in some way, shape, or form to the actual continuous momentum maps which you care about, um, which were intrinsic to the original theory. So, so, and the reason why that's potentially interesting is because now you have a sort of a global object that's which you can compare. It's like which is less reliant on this, um, you know, sort of somewhat ad hoc sampling. It's like of the solution space. Um, so, so that's. Um, something which you know still remains to be understood but at the least it's like this you sort of a potential framework for thinking about um, again what are good choices of approximation spaces uh, in a way which respects you know some deeper global geometric properties as opposed to you know um, directly working it's like at the level of uh, individual solutions uh, realizations of the solutions so i'm not sure if that answers your question but, but i think it's kind of an interesting direction Robert? Yes. May I ask a question? Helena. Uh, Melvin, I was wondering, you, you have uh, shown a uh, lot of theory in your talk, but uh, no mm -hmm. numerical experiments. So can you right. comment on what kind of, uh, of uh, problems you, you have mm -hmm. been trying this method? So, so uh, well, we haven't actually tried this uh, on anything. And part of it is because the result is basically saying that um, instead of, you don't need to implement a multi-symplectic integrator using this discrete variational framework. The point is that if it so happens that the spaces you work with are finite element exterior calculus spaces, for example, right? Then you can just go out and you can do the usual thing which finite element people do, which is sort of this weak formulation. It's like, you know, sort of uh, using Galakian finite element methods and you will get the same answer. So um, what this basically means is that you don't have to develop new implementations uh, in order to get all the benefits of, um, you know, it's like geometric discretizations, if you will, right? And that, again, there is no choice to be made between using, say, finite element exterior calculus or using multi-symplectic integrators. They are one and the same for the 
class of problems where they have common validity, which are for Lagrangian and Hamiltonian PDEs. Um, so if you're willing to, um, you know, it's like focus on space-time discretizations, which are just tensor products in space and time, then again, the usual semi-discretization method with a variational discretization in time is in a very precise sense, a multi-symplectic discretization. But, so, but did you identi identify some uh, literature, some methods that have been implemented by someone else who, who fall in this category? Um, I mean, the, you know, the part of the problem, I guess, is that, in, you know, final mixture calculus has primarily been focused on discretization of elliptic problems, right? So the work is um, sort of more preliminary in terms of the applications to um, parabolic and hyperbolic problems. But again, the general framework is, is um, applies to that, um, at least as a sem spatial semi-discretization. Um, and um, so, you know, if you wanted to use, um, you know, Phoenix or Firedrake, for example, it's like which implements these final mystery calculus spaces, you could use that to construct, you know, PD discretizations of um, time evolution problems um, in this setting. So uh, again, the goal is not to develop new software. The point um, in some sense, the main take home message is that you don't have to develop new software to implement the multi symplectic integrator. You can now use existing off the shelf, it's like, you know, um, frameworks to do this, but you can analyze the resulting methods in this kind of variational framework, which I think is, is in some sense, the best case situation. All right, it's a little bit like collocation type methods, right? It's like you don't think about collocation methods in the way they're normally formulated, you think of them as Runge-Kutta methods. And, and so, so this is a little bit like that. You can you, you can look at multi simplex discretizations, but you can implement them using sort of fairly standard finite element type of techniques now without worrying about where they eventually came from. But you can analyze them using sort of the, you know, theoretical framework of multi simplex variational integrators. So not sure. Okay, uh, well. let's leave it there. Thank you, Melvin. Thank you for your Thank talk. You. And let's move on to uh, Francois Gabe Balmas. You'll have to unshare.